Dear Lord, we're so very thankful for the way you care for us, and we're thankful, Father, for your love for us, uh, manifested, of course, in the gift of thy Son, Jesus. We pray, Father, that as we study today, we'll grow, we'll grow closer to thee through growing closer to thy word. Uh, be with uh, everybody in the congregation. Be with those that might be traveling, those that might be listening at, at a distance. We ask, Father, that you continue to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I meant to mention, I don't know if any of you ever uh, came across this fellow, uh, Mark, Mark Nichols Posey. He was named for Gus Nichols. And his daddy, Glenn Posey, was a gospel preacher down in central Alabama, Walker County, Birmingham, and all that. Now, Mark Posey was, uh, for 30 years, has been going to Ukraine and uh, working over there, establishing congregations and, and edifying brothers and sisters over there. And he was there uh, until just a few days ago and had planned to come home on the 23rd. But uh, the Russians started hurling rockets in and they shut the airport down and shut down transportation throughout the country. Even though the whole time they were amassed on the border, they said they weren't going to, they did do it. And they came in and uh, created quite a bit of havoc and killed a bunch of folks. I don't know what's going on right now, but I know it's not good. So Mark was over there and he, of course he couldn't get his regular flight out. And uh, he'd been there for 30 days almost. And it was about, you know, he naturally his family was concerned. Pauly, his wife, and Mark and Pauly live in Winfield, Alabama. And he's a preacher there and one of the elders. And so they were, we, everybody was concerned that knew him about getting out of uh, Ukraine. You may have seen reports out of the Huntsville News. They had some material about him on there. But finally... Uh, he got in a bus with a bunch of other folks and uh, went to the border, Lviv, the town near the Polish border, and uh, stayed there with, he said, thousands upon thousands of people at that border. And I don't know the mechanics of it, but finally he was able to cross over into Poland. Of course, Poland's a NATO country, as we all know. And uh, there were, as I understand it, there were American and NATO troops at the Polish-Ukrainian border to facilitate the crossover of foreign nationals, Americans, or whoever else was trying to get out of there. So he, uh, as of last night, last I heard, last I saw anything on the communication devices, last night I heard that he was in Warsaw, and a hotel, and I think Paula even put a picture of the hotel up. Look, looks sort of like a, a nice Hampton Inn. But anyway, he was in at the at the hotel at the airport. So how far he's gotten since then, I really don't know. But you just continue to remember that family. Mark Posey, good boy, good boy. Well, he's a boy to me, but he's a grown man. He's in his fifties, I think. So I want us to think about the Book of James for a little while. We might, might look at the book of James for a, a couple of times when we're together. But one reason that I love the book of James, first of all, it's short and you can more or less remember most of it as you start going through it and uh, thinking about it. We know that he was the half-brother of the Lord and an elder in the church in Jerusalem and that uh, uh, Martin Luther called his letter an epistle of straw. And it's because of the emphasis on, you know, doing what you believe, not just believing something, but uh, faith is shown by works. And so that's, that's a big part of the book. But another big part of the book of James is communication. And in, in uh, the time that I've spent in local ministry, one of the primary things that's helpful to the life of a local church is good communication. Uh, not only between the elders and the church, but between church members. And, you know, 
How many times have you, you know, you, you've been, uh, you've heard about something that happened, and I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that. Because that's, that's normal in our busy days and times. We just keep going all the time. We're all over the place. But communication is important, and, and uh, folks can't, can't do something that they don't know about. And, uh, but how to communicate sometimes gets to be a little sketchy because we just don't know exactly what, uh, what we need to be doing. And James helps us with a lot of that. He, there's verse 19 of chapter 1 is, I think, a good, a good earmark for us to keep in mind about communication. James said, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. If we take that verse, we, we, uh, we see that some of the most important things that anybody can learn to be a good communicator is to stay calm, to keep one's uh, ears alert, and uh, one's mouth closed. And a lot of times people have, have trouble with that because they think, if I'm going to communicate, I've got to be talking. Well, at some point, we will have to, to speak if we're going to communicate properly. But more often, we need to be listening. We need to be listening. Listening to each other and listening to the Word of God. So let's look at this verse very carefully. Verse 19 of James chapter 1. James said for us to be swift to hear. Swift to hear. And, and I'm always telling my family, which they get tired of. They've been tired of it a long time. But I always tell them, you know, they say something like, well, I didn't know that. I say, you need to listen quicker. Listen quicker. Well, swift to hear is a nice way to say you got to listen quicker. And people say, well, you can't listen but at one speed. Oh, yes, you can. You can listen a lot quicker than just idling, you know. And when, when I was younger, I picked up a little expression from a fellow for whom I worked for a number of years in, in a drugstore. Uh, he... Uh, and he's the one I got this idea from. His name was uh, Mr. Grossman. And I may have mentioned Mr. Grossman before because I've got a few little things that he has uh, imparted that I think are memorable. And uh, he, was, he, worked, he was the owner of a drugstore and actually a couple of drugstores and a couple of nursing homes. He's a very successful businessman. And uh, I remember when I got that job, I was just so excited because it was... And I thought it had to be the best job that any kid could have in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Our neighborhood was called Lakeside. And uh, the drugstore was Lakeside Pharmacy. And I found out from a buddy of mine that, uh, he, that, that they were going to hire a new delivery boy. Now, you can imagine a teenager in 1963 or four having a job where his job was to drive around the whole neighborhood from 5 o'clock in the evening to 10 o'clock at night. Now, there's a lot of work involved in that, and, but you were driving a car that you didn't have to buy and you didn't have to pay for. And I was a kid that was just car crazy. There was no way for me to get a car. My automobile cost me 35 cents a drive. It was called... It's called the uh, Richmond Transit Authority. It was a big old bus that stopped outside the house. I'd get on that bus and go. Anyway, I loved that job, but it's a job I really wanted, and I wanted to keep that job. So I picked up this expression for him. He'd been, he gave me a set of instructions. He gave me a set of instructions that I didn't quite get. I didn't get what he was telling me to do. Um, and what it was, was, uh, you know how you used to go to the drugstore and you get an ice cream cone? You remember that, Joe? You get an ice cream cone? Well, he sold, I, sold ice cream at the fountain. And when you, when you changed out the big, I think five gallons or whatever it was, when you changed those out, you had to rinse the outside of the carton with warm water 
and pour the melted ice cream out on top of the new ice cream and let that freeze. That way you didn't waste any. Well, I didn't get that at first. I thought that might be a little bit, a little bit uh, assiduous. But he said, uh, no, you didn't listen quick enough. And that confused me. But I, come, I came to know what he was talking about. And what it is, and when you think about the, the Bible, the Word of God, especially, you have to prepare yourself to hear the instructions that you are to be given. In other words, when we go to the Bible and we listen to the Word of God or when we hear a preacher talking or a Bible class teacher uh, talking or when we sing together in a song, we need to prepare ourselves to be taught. You have to be ready to hear. You don't just hear, you have to be ready to hear. You have to prepare yourself for hearing. And uh, I I learned that. I learned that you had to get ready because what I would do, I would be thinking about something else and then somebody would be giving me the instructions that I needed like a boss in a job and I wasn't prepared to hear it. I had to be uh, ready for that. And so when, when I've read James and you've read James, I thought of those experiences that I had in the past, and I was uh, amazed how biblical this this information is. Uh, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We we miss a lot of good information because we're not swift to hear. And a lot of times in communicating with each other, we don't really communicate. What we do is we wait. I mean, uh, I had a teacher at Freed Hardeman named Gerald Fulkerson, and uh, he taught our communication classes. And a lot of times what we find when we look at it is that we're not really communicating by listening to see what the other person is truly saying. This can be in a husband-wife relationship or friends or whatever it is. What we're doing, we're waiting until we hear a break so that we can get in there and say something. And that's not communication. When you're just waiting for your turn to talk, uh, that's not recipient of communication. So we need to, we need to listen quicker so we don't miss uh, that communication. And, we, and he says for us to be slow to speak, which is, it's impossible for us to miss the contrast here with quick hearing, because good communication requires more listening than talking. And I've been in a lot of college classrooms uh, as a student and as a teacher, and there's always the guy in the class that had to make sure he let everybody know what he knew, whether he knew it or not. He won't let you know that he knew. You know, I, I'm, a lot of people, they communicate one thing very quickly. It is that they think they're the smartest person in the room. But uh, frequently, the person who's always wanting to put their two cents worth in and, and must always just almost insist that that happen. Sometimes they, they don't communicate at all and they... They blurt out some things that might be true but don't need to be said right at that moment, perhaps. Or they say something that might be helpful at another time but disastrous at that particular time. And if you ever thought about it this way, uh, real communication can only, you can only receive proper communication when you're not talking yourself. Say, I'm not, I'm not picking up anything from you because I'm talking. And the, the, our, our classroom setup is, is that way. You know, we're set up in that fashion. But, you know, at the same time, we realize that uh, the only way to really pick up on what's going on around us is to take the time to listen carefully. But there are also circumstances where we have to be swift to speak. Because, uh, you know, they have information that will be valuable for the audience involved. It's imperative to get it out there. You think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You think about, you know, if there's a, you know, some sort of an emergency. We, there are times when we're swift to speak. So communication is, is dealt with here in this 
in this one little verse. But over in chapter 3, James deals with uh, communication in another way. He deals with a general discussion of the tongue. He says in chapter 3 and verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And that's a very sobering expression right there. Uh, the older translation says, not let it, not, don't let many of you become masters. And the word master is used in the sense of being a, a teacher. You know, when you, you know, we have in our society bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees. In the, in the, in the ancient, in the older world, pretty ancient world, the master was just somebody who was recognized through a dent of experience and, uh, and study as being a good teacher. And that's why when the, the word rabbi in the New Testament, uh, when Jesus is referred to as rabbi, which means teacher or master teacher. But James here says, Brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that uh, we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now this is a very sobering passage to me as a, as, a, as a gospel preacher. And it ought to be to any of us who have an opportunity to teach somebody else. And it goes hand in hand with our role in the New Testament church as attempting to establish and continue to keep established the Bible church, the pattern revealed in the New Testament. Because it's so important that we be careful about what we teach. You know, I read a lot of material that comes across my desk that uh, comes from our whole brotherhood. And it's, it amazes me sometimes. Now, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but it, it amazes me sometimes how rapidly folks get off of the pattern revealed in the text and move in whatever direction. In other words, they teach, they're teaching things that they don't have biblical references for now you know we uh you're, you're all familiar with uh, 2 Timothy 1 13 where uh, Paul told uh, Timothy to follow the pattern of sound words now that's been given uh, a name in our brotherhood it's called pattern theology it's a good name matter of fact I think uh East Hill and some of the lectures in the years past have had uh uh, the fellow that wrote a lot of that material, Behold the Pattern, and so forth, uh, here in the lectureship. It's a great idea. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, uh, that's just common sense. How in the world do we decide what we do as matters of faith and practice in our lives? Why, how, why do we... How did we decide what we were going to do this morning in this worship service? Well, we looked in the, in the biblical text and we saw what people in the first century did. And why is that important? Because people in the early church were under the leadership of inspired people. The apostles and those that were around the apostles that the apostles had laid their hands on, like in Acts 8 when, when uh, the people of Samaria had their hands uh, apostles' hands laid on them, allowing them to have these miraculous gifts. These people at that time were following a pattern that, uh, that wasn't of their own creation. They were following a pattern that God created and imparted to mankind. And the genius of what we're doing, when I say genius, the, the core of what we're doing in churches of Christ, the faithful congregations, is that we're following the same pattern because that pattern ultimately got written down into the pages of Holy Scripture. And so it's important to realize that if we're going to teach anything, like James says here, let not many of you become teachers, we shall receive the stricter judgment. We have to decide what's the source of teaching. Now, I've talked to Brother Johnny about uh, teaching, that business, you know, I think he had a little experience in that area over the years. And uh, Ginger, my wife, taught for 45 years. I've been, been a number of the rest of you in here, done a little teaching. Now, uh, 
Things are changing in the world of education, as many of you know. But when I, when I went to work at teaching at a junior college, and when Ginger went to work teaching in high school, you were told that at the end of a particular term, the students need to have been exposed to a particular set of materials. And that was your job to teach. You have to teach that. You can't go into your uh, U.S. history class and uh, teach how to play mumbly peg. You got to teach what the uh, syllabus says for you to teach. So when you look at you take that concept and idea, which we all know is, makes all the sense in the world. If you're trying to have a business and you want to teach your employees how to operate in that business, you have to, you have to be careful in how you teach them. Make sure they get the right information. Take that over to biblical things. Uh, it's, it's careful. We need to be careful not to become teachers too quickly because we're going to receive this stricter judgment. I was reading in one of these Brotherhood publications not too long ago about how that uh, that particular congregation of which this person was a part had decided that uh, they needed to not be following the New Testament pattern, that the New Testament pattern was really an invalid concept and idea, and that instead people needed to follow what their own hearts directed them to do. Well, there's a problem with that. If, if you have uh, 20 or 30 or 50 or 500 people all following their own hearts, where are they going? <clears throat> They're going in a lot of different directions, aren't they? And so I, I think it's good to remember, as, as James says here, don't be teaching something like that. And, and don't follow that kind of teaching because it's, it, it ends up being a dead-end situation. So James introduces uh, chapter 3 with this idea of being careful how we use the tongue or our gift of language in terms of teaching. We need to be sure that what we teach people is the truth. I was thinking about Ukraine the other day, Joe and I. Uh, I remembered back in 1991, I had the opportunity to go over there. I think I was gone about three weeks or something in that range. Flew into Moscow, rode the train down to Slavyansk in, in Ukraine, one of the places where the Russians are, are interested in coming in. I'm not surprised because uh, right up the street at Kramatorsk, there's, a, um, there's an old, uh, probably still functioning, uh, airplane factory uh, made uh, jet fighters. As a matter of fact, they had one on a pedestal. Remember when you were a little boy and you made your plastic model and it came with a little stand, you could set that thing up? They've got the same thing, but lifestyle, life size there in that, in that town. I got to go down there and, and be in that place. And the amazing thing about that, and these people have been taught New Testament Christianity before, and they didn't want to stop learning it. They wanted to continue. They wanted to continue to be taught. And every time you try to get up and leave and go do something else, they'd say, wait, just one more. Just one more. You know, we don't often have that now here, but that's one of the great things about teaching. So one of the lessons from James is from verse 19 of chapter 1. The other one is to be careful about what we teach. Uh, and we, when we teach people something, we need to teach them the truth. And a lot of folks today say, oh, no, oh, no, that's an that's a egocentric, that's, a, a, that's a, a terrible idea to think that there's just one truth. Well, there is just one truth. There's really one truth about everything. We just don't always know what it is. I don't know every truth in the Bible, do you? I know, I know the ones I know, and I'm, I hope to learn more all the time. But there, and there, there's, there's truth in the world. And uh, just because I don't know all of it. Somebody said, well, you don't know. I don't know all, of, all the truth. You know, I don't know all the historical truth. Man, you study the rest of your life. And I, I, I plan to, to discover as much truth as possible. But there is truth. And there's one way to prove it. And that is if you look at the area of mathematics 
it's obvious that there is mathematical truth. And there's no, there's no wiggle room there. Two plus two is four. Now, you may have noticed a couple of years ago, somebody came out and said, now don't be teaching the children that the only right answer to two plus two is four. Don't teach the children that because if they get it wrong, they may think less of themselves. Y'all see the problem there? Listen, when I was in school, uh, <laughs> Of course, you love these old. See, we're we're okay in here with this because there are a few of us in here who've got a few years under our belt. But I remember Miss Jordan, who was our math teacher, and uh, she taught us our uh, geometry and trigonometry. And she expected you to know something when you got there. And if you acted like uh, you didn't pay any attention to what she was saying about what the truth about her mathematics class was, she'd whack you on the head with a ruler. She would actually hit you on the head. And you could never, she was a, she was a lady who was a shot putter. You know, she was a substantial lady. And she would come up the aisle, and, and she had one eye that went one way, and the other eye that went the other way. You couldn't tell who she was coming after. But she'd get you. Now, truth, uh, you, you can look at other areas, scientific areas, mathematical areas, all sorts of areas. You'll see that truth is one thing and that we need to understand that. And in our communication, when we talk to people, our friends in denominational Christianity, our friends out there, one of the early things to show them is that, now listen, we love you. We love everybody, right? It doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, we love you. No matter where you're from, what color you are, any of that stuff, we love you. All right, we love you. And we want the best for you. That's what loving people means, right? We want the best. However, having said all that, when it comes to the religion of Christianity, there's only one truth. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. We all know that, John 8, 32. There's not multiple truths about the Christian faith. And uh, so that's, that's where we need to start with that sort of thing and make sure that we get that across to our friends and uh, that if we can communicate the idea that there's a, their truth is singular in nature, whether we know it or not. See, a lot of times when you start talking about you shall know the truth, truth shall make you free, or all scriptures given by inspiration of God, you know, those passages, people say, well, well, you must really think you're smart to say that uh, there's only one truth and, and you know it about some of these things. You need to be sure to tell people, well, there is but one truth on any particular subject in the Bible. Doesn't mean that I know every one of them, but there is only one truth. As long as I understand that, I've got a foundation from which I can move forward. So James would tell us, don't become many teachers because uh, you're going to receive a stricter judgment. And that's why I always tell young preachers, since I'm an old one now, I always tell young preachers, fellas, when you preach, preach what you know. Don't preach your doubts. Don't preach what might be or what could be or what you think maybe should be. Preach what you know is the truth. And that's a wonderful thing. If you begin with that foundation, you got so much less to worry about. Now, somebody said, well, you, won't, you don't answer all the questions. Well, people can come up with questions for which there are no good answers. But we only want to answer the questions that can be answered. And what's the old saying? With a thus saith the Lord. That's what James would have us do. Now there's, there's one other element here. We're just going to touch on it today. We'll pick up with it uh, perhaps uh, the next time we're back. And that's uh, what James says about communication in terms of uh, what we might call stumbling communication when we stumble in communication. Another word for that might be gossip. And I know you don't have any of that here, so I'm just speaking in terms of 
a biblical, biblical theory here. Uh, everywhere I've ever been, there's been gossip. And some places I've been doing the gossiping. How about you? You know, you say, well, I don't gossip. Well, let me ask you what you talk about during football season or basketball season. You say things you know happened at that team, but you don't know it happened. That's just, that's gossip. Now, doesn't make much difference when it comes to sports like that, but it does make a difference when we think about talking about each other. And, and that's what James refers to here. He says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect or mature man or a full-grown man. Word perfect means all of those things. Able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Uh, granddaughter Lucy, which is the only one we've got, is a horse-riding girl. 12 years old, rides a horse. And uh, she's an equestrian rider, and she, she loves working with horses and all that stuff. And I, I've been amazed. Little girl, like, she's not that big. And she'll be on that horse, and that horse will start to do something. She'll jerk that animal around. And uh, 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 he, I, I was watching her the other day, uh, and she was going along the side. You know how they ride in those uh, stable uh, corral things. I forget what the name of it is. But anyway, the, guy, the horse stumbled. The horse stumbled and almost threw her off. She reached up and she whacked that horse on the side of the neck. And, uh, and I thought, well, man, he, that horse is a lot bigger than you are. But he straightened up. He did what she told him to. We put bits in horses' mouths. They may obey us. And we turn the whole body. Um, look also at the ships. Though they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. I love the old translation. Whithersoever the governor listeth. That's much better prettier and so even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among the members that it defiles, defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell now what James is warning us about here is the danger of a tongue that's loosed without any restraint or reason. A tongue that is loosed uh, without uh, being restrained by judgment. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. Or going back to verse 19 of, of chapter 1. A tongue that is uh, very quick to speak and uh, not giving adequate thought about what is said before that, that speech is made. So James warns us about this sort of thing in this passage. It's a, when he says, no man can tame the tongue, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the simil similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. And then he, he describes that further. So we know that the, the James, in dealing with communication, uh, really does get down to brass tacks. And uh, one of the most damaging things that ever happens to a congregation is when people start talking without knowing and talking about other people. And uh, you all know this. You've seen it over the years, uh, perhaps not in recent times, but it does happen from time to time. Now, what James also deals with in dealing with this concept of, of communication, one of the things he deals with that we don't necessarily expect him to deal with is the role that pride can play in damaging communication relationships <clears throat> that people have with each other. And we'll see this in, in chapter 4. We look at uh, verse 1. He says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Now when he says from among you, is he talking about the general world? James is writing to churches. 
He's writing the congregations of God's people. He says, where do wars and fights, where do these battles come from among you? He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? That's a particular kind of pleasure that he's talking about. He's, he's going to be referring here to the, the, the pleasure that comes from pride. You know, people, people say sometimes, uh, well, at least I have my pride. On everything else, at least I have my pride. I'm not sure that pride is something we ought to work at trying to keep. Uh, because if I'm going to be prideful... I'm going to have to be interested in myself, right? I'm going to put myself on a pedestal. Do I belong on a pedestal? Listen, you may not know it, but I know I don't belong on a pedestal. And the truth is nobody else does either. The text says, uh, You lust and yet do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, verse 2 indicates, you know, we might think, well, this is a rough crowd that they're out there murdering. He's, he's using language. It's like when, you know, if you hate, if, if you don't love somebody and you hate them, it's just like killing them. That's, what, that's the idea here. We've got no business as Christians, as children of God, of hating anybody. And so then he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And what he's talking about here is the self-centered request that a prideful person makes. Why? Have you ever been around somebody who thought they were all it was? They thought everything was about them? That everything was centered in their lives, you know, that they were the, they were the number one, they were the big dog. We used to call them, in, back home we call them, God thinks he's a big dog. But, you know, nobody's that big a dog. And so the person who has the prideful, everything is about them. How long does it take you to get tired of somebody who wants you to know everything in the world about them and they don't want to know anything about you? Doesn't take you long to get tired of a person like that. And James warns us, it's very practical. You ask him this that you may spend it on your pleasures. Everything that person gets, he's going to spend it on himself. What happens when we get older? We stop worrying about what we need for ourselves and start thinking about what we need for our children or our grandchildren or our friends or the people at church. We stop worrying about what we need for ourselves. And we realize that, it, you know, one of the great things about being a child of God is that God takes care of us. We don't have to worry about that. So he refers to these people, these Christians that he's rebuking for their pride. He says adulterers and adulteresses, not literally necessarily, but he's talking about in terms of their pridefulness. He said, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's one thing, you know, we gather together on the Lord's Day and on Wednesday night and other times we have opportunity to be together. We are, we are surviving the rest of the time of our week based on the solace, the comfort and the strength that we gain from being together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Being able to pray together, to sing together, and to study together, have the Lord's Supper together, to give together, to do all those things. That's what separates us from the world. That's what allows us to survive the time that we spend without each other. Then he says, Or do you think that Scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, jealously rather, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humility is, uh, I believe, the key to 
having a happy, successful life, no matter what it is that you do. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks in the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, a poor in spirit person is a humble person. It's a person whose spirit's not out of control. A person whose spirit is under the control of God. And again, uh, going back to the idea of, of uh, having an opportunity to talk to uh, younger preachers and younger Christians, humility is the key to success, particularly, uh, I believe, in the preaching business. Humility is the key. You know, I, I've uh, uh, a lot of times in, in, the, in the world of, I don't mean to be on a soapbox about this, but a lot of times in the world of preaching, the preachers tend to get into a mindset to say, well, now, I'm in competition with this other preacher, or uh, I want to get so far in my career, you know, in the brotherhood, and be on these programs and do all this sort of thing. And many people can and do that, and it's a wonderful thing. However, the real key is humility. You do your work. You do the best job you possibly can. But you don't worry about who's to promote you or what kind of progress you're going to make. See, being a Christian is not like being in business. There's some similar things about it. The elders have to operate the congregation in terms of its survival in a material sense in a business-like fashion. But what we are about is not a business. It's not a matter of profit and loss. It's a matter of souls and heaven. And to approach it uh, in any way other than with great humility is to approach it in a bad fashion. And I'm, you know, I've known a lot of preachers, and I, I tell you what, about 90% of them are humble fellows. And uh, I have to say this, if, if they're not humble, the brethren will take care of that for them. They'll, 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 uh, you, you know, brother Tom Holland, he's been here an awful lot. He used to tell us, he said, fellas, he said, you have never had your pedigree read to you like you can have it read to you at the back of a church building by a lady that you've said something that you've upset. And uh, I'm telling, I'm here to tell you that brother Holland was right about that. All right, that's just a little lesson from the book of James this morning. Perhaps we'll be able to pick up and have a few more with that as time goes along. And I think, I think we're about time to, to break. Is that correct? About a quarter past?